I'm Pete Quinnell, welcome to the WrestleTalk News, and as it turns out, WrestleMania can be transmitted via explosion. Who knew? But while everything is totally fine, and in fact, even better than it was before here at WrestleTalk HQ, things don't seem quite as rosy over in WWE, as a new report from PW Insider Elite notes that several backstage segments involving female talents were cut from this week's episode of Raw. This has reportedly resulted in a slightly bubbling paranoia backstage, slightly bubbling paranoia, title of WWE's next premium live event, particularly from new talent who recently returned to the company, as they become ever more fearful of Vince McMahon gaining more power with more changes. This has unsurprisingly left some members of the women's locker room very unhappy. Perhaps linked with this, Fightful Select is also reporting that a backstage damage control segment that was due to air on Raw was scrapped, which marks the second time in three weeks that a segment involving Bailey has been pulled at the last minute. And despite Vince McMahon not being physically present at Raw this week, according to Fightful Select, his metaphysical presence over the shows is undeniable, with unhappy talent, last minute changes, and TV shows that are mediocre at best. It's the classic Vince trifecta. And with the company due to change even more soon, courtesy of their merger with UFC under Endeavor, it seems to be only a matter of time before we start to see even bigger changes. John Morrison, fresh off his win at Creator Clash 2, where I assume he called himself Johnny Boxing, and if he didn't, what a waste, recently speculated on the MMA Hour with Ariel Helwani that WWE could let a lot of people go with this merger, and for the wrestling talent, he's at least happy that AEW exists. And it very much doesn't seem unreasonable to think that releases, whether that's from WWE firing people or wrestlers actively calling for their release or letting their contracts expire because they're upset with the company, are very much on the horizon. But never mind all that, there's always Stone Cold, he's always reliable for a nostalgia pop, right? Unless he doesn't show up at your biggest show of the year after you approached him about a match. Hmm. It had been reported for a while in the lead up to WrestleMania 39 that WWE very much wanted Stone Cold Steve Austin to have a match at the show, and now Stone Cold has confirmed it himself, speaking with Justin Barrasso on Sports Illustrated, where he said, I told them, I'm just fixing to go into production on this show, Stone Cold takes on America, and until we start production, I don't know what my life looks like. He then went on to say that because of delays in said production for the show, there was no way he was going to be able to get in shape in time for Mania. So that's why we missed out on a Stone Cold match at Mania 39 because of Stone Cold takes on America, which I'm sure all three of its fans will be fine with. Normally, when wrestlers are planning the next move in their career, they can be quite cagey, don't let out any details, play things close to the chest, unless you're Kota Ibushi, in which case you give daily updates for everything you're doing, who you're talking to, what your plans are, your date of birth, mother's maiden name. Kota Ibushi reportedly spoke to Dark Pura Resu Flosion on Twitter, where he said he and Kenny Omega have been talking lately about things more closely related to wrestling, how his knees are and such, and also that he wants to start talks with Tony Khan soon. Oh. You're just gonna say that bit out loud, huh? But he didn't stop there, as he also said that come all in at Wembley in August, he'd like to potentially face Hangman Page or Chris Jericho in a singles match, or potentially tag with the Golden Elite or the Golden Lovers. Yes. Yes, please. Hey, Pete. Hey, bud. How's it going? Yeah, no, great, yeah. Uh, we, 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 we cool, we cool, yeah? You, after the, the, the whole explosion a couple of days ago? Yeah, I mean, that's just that's war under the bridge, isn't it? You know, yeah. they, you know, I mean, I blew you up one time. You tried time. to blow me up. Yeah, no, I did, yeah. So, yeah. We, I mean, we're basically even at this and point. He got a nice suit out of it. Yeah, it's actually pretty nice. Quite like the suit. Looking pretty sharp. Oh, thank you yeah. very much, yeah. And, I mean, to be honest, I really should have seen it coming. You should have seen it coming. Yeah, it's, it's on me. I yeah. don't know how more clear I can be. Yeah, I, I said pipe bomb. It, it, it pipe bomb challenge. Every time I saw you. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. Well. You're always quoting that thing as well. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Anyway, you've got a dynamite I've got a dynamite for you. Hot tech. Hunter! Yeah. Good to have you on, but it's fun! Whoop! Now it's time for my review of AEW Dynamite in about five minutes. The show opened on the four pillars of AEW, who've been with the company since the beginning. Jungle Boy, Sammy Guevara, Darby Allen, and a support wrestle talk sign! You made you, Tony, don't you ever forget that. The three cut works shoot promos on each other. Jungle Boy is only here because he's part of the California clique. Darby's a failed skateboarder, and Sammy's a scumbag piece of S-work behind the scenes. But this was a step down compared to the fantastic segments the feud has had so far, because it had two pretty significant things missing, MJF and sound mixing. According to live reports, the crowd were very hot at points on this show. It did not come across that way on TV, which is a recurring problem with AEW. The crowd heat jumped up several notches, though, when Max finally came out at the end to announce a three-person single elimination tournament. But MJF, that's not a series of five increasingly hard challenges. I'm lost here. Now, you're probably asking yourself right now, how do you book a three-person single elimination tournament? The answer is, you can't. Max drew Darby's name randomly out of hat, meaning Alan got a buy 
into the next round, which Darby uncharacteristically obnoxiously celebrated. So it'll be Jungle Boy versus Guevara tonight, with the winner facing Darby next week, with the winner of that facing MJF at Double or Nothing. A round robin tournament of everyone facing each other would have been far more narratively satisfying. The storyline picked up when MJF made an agreement with Sammy later on, where Max would make sure Guevara got the pay-per-view match and a load of money if Sammy would lay down for him, starting a very funny, not at all precarious friendship. In Britt Baker's Pittsburgh hometown, she teamed with Jamie Hayter to take on the outcast Tony Storm and Ruby 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 Soho. The action was really good, with Hayter getting taken out with a kayfabe injury and Britt having to overcome essentially all three members of the outcast by herself, making Ruby tap in the lockjaw. It made Baker look awesome, but that did somewhat come at the expense of all of the outcasts. The Elite came out where Kenny Omega demanded they settle the Blackpool Combat Club beef once and for all. R wrong, wrong beef, Kenny. Settle, settle the punk beef, but the punk beef. <laughs> the BCC outsmarted the faces with Danielson distracting them on the Tron long enough for Mox, Claudio and Gila Utah to attack them from behind. Don Callis then brilliantly came out with a chair to make the save, realized that's a terrible idea. He's a carny piece of S word and ran to the back to return with a Takeshita, far more effective than a chair. This was a terrific angle with layers upon layers upon layers. Takeshita had become Danielson's ally during the MJF feud, and here they are on opposite sides. Don isn't a heel, I, I think, but he is actually trying to force his man Takeshita into the elite so Hangman Page isn't needed. Seeing Kenny and Takeshita clear the ring was an awesome sight too. This was the best thing on the show that wasn't Arn Anderson's finger glock. With Powerhouse Hobbs having QTV in his corner, Wardlow brought in the services of Arn Anderson, who still has the best gimmick in wrestling, which is that if confronted with a carjacker, he'd shoot them with a Glock. Wardlow and Hobbs had a meaty hoss fight, which ended with Arn and Penta nullifying QT's interference and Wardlow winning back the TNT title. Christian and Luchasaurus Dark stared him down on the ramp afterwards, presumably setting up his first title feud. I'm very into the pairing of Wardlow and Arn. Wardlow has worked best when he has a mouthpiece, and the TNT title feud against Luchasaurus and Christian is going to be all kinds of dead deadlines. But it's such a shame that it's come at the expense of Hobbs. It feels like nothing more than a transitional champion to get a pop in a hometown. He also doesn't feel any better coming off his title run, which is a huge squandered opportunity. I kind of feel the same about Jay White's full debut into AEW. He's such an amazing, incredible wrestler, fresh off years at the top of New Japan's main event scene. I assumed he'd either enter AEW or WWE in a very high profile program or top title picture. Instead, and no offense, he's randomly feuding with Ricky Starks. And in his first all in contracted match, he played second fiddle of getting Commander over. Commander was mesmerized. Tightrope running the ropes into shooting star presses, but then he just suddenly lost to a Blade Runner at the end. Put Commander against someone else to showcase him, and concentrate on establishing White in a different match. Sean Spears got involved, creating a Franken team with Ricky Starks to stand tall in the post-match angle, and baffled that after all those months, this is the creative you have for Jay White. After three weeks of not looking at each other, Chris Jericho and Adam Cole shared a ring. Cole started off respectful, saying he's modeled a lot of his career on Jericho, even his catchphrase. Bay Bay, which I somehow never realized until he said that. It was a refreshing change seeing Jericho out there by himself too, which almost exactly on cue as I thought that, Daniel Garcia jumped Cole from behind. What followed was a fun blending of two separate storylines. Britt Baker came down to slap Jericho to be jumped by the outcasts. They handcuffed Cole to a rope while he watched Soraya beat Baker down with a kendo stick. The two lovers reaching out to each other for protection they couldn't quite grasp. Unfortunately, I didn't buy the physicality. The kendo stick is the least effective weapon in the hardcore arsenal, and 12 weak looking shots from Soraya wasn't visually violent enough for me to properly invest in the peril. One positive was how they injured Hater earlier, explaining why she didn't make the save. Could have done that with Keith Lee too though. The acclaimed and Daddy Ass won a fun match against 2.0 and Jake Hager, and the main event saw Jungle Boy vs Guevara in a very equally matched back and forth, anything you can do, I can do better fight. The perfect angle to take on this story, where the four pillars are all just as good as each other. The finish saw Sammy shotgun drop kick Jungle Boy off the turnbuckle onto a table outside for Max to cut JB off just before he made it back into the ring and therefore losing by count out. MJF and Sammy then essentially had a live sex celebration in victory, hugging, putting each other on their shoulders, worshipping. It was really fun heel stuff and sets up the eventual no honour amongst thieves turn. This week's Dynamite is 70%. Vince McMahon has heat with the top star. Watch on to find out who.
practically even at this and, point. And you've got a nice suit. Yeah, yeah, I, I like the suit. It's quite nice. It's quite, it's quite all right, yeah. Suit buddies, yeah, suit, suit friends. Suit friends. Let's never say that again. <laughs> so